Um, first of all, I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank the um, Fisheries Research and Development Corporation for sponsoring this session. The Bears greatly appreciates this support. As we appreciate the support over the years in just general A Bears research that the corporation's given. So last year, real earnings from fisheries and aquaculture hit $2.6 billion. That's a level of production not seen since 2007-8. In the next five years, we see more growth. Competitiveness is also improving. Exchange rates are down, fuel is more affordable, access to labour is easier, and trade agreements have recently been made with some important trade partners. So all this is encouraging news for the seafood industry. Today, I'll first provide an update on global seafood consumption, then some detail about Australian production, consumption and trade, and wrap up by elaborating on a few factors improving the industry's competitiveness. Let's first look at some drivers of growth. And there are a few. First, seafood is highly traded, and the market's growing both globally and in Australia. Second, our industry's competitiveness is improving. In particular, our current level of exchange rates is making our industry more competitive abroad and helping industry to compete domestically with imported um, product. But there are other factors that have improved competitiveness in recent times. Fuel costs are lower, there's easing labour market pressures on the industry, and as I mentioned, the recent trade agreements. Third, there are expansion plans for increased salmon eat production in Tasmania. I mention this because over the past decade, salmon eats has driven most of the growth of the Australian seafood industry, and as Senator alluded to this earlier. And finally, mostly, most of Australia's catch is sourced from fish stocks that are sustainable, and this is positive for maintaining a profitable industry. So let's look at a couple of factors, starting with the global scene. It's clear from this figure that a rise in world population is driving most of the growth in world seafood consumption. It's also clear that since the mid-1990s, most of the growth in consumption has been met by increased aquaculture production. It's boomed in Asia, particularly in China, India, Vietnam and Indonesia. The increase in aquaculture production has changed the market landscape for the Australian seafood sector. Producers in Asia have actively marketed their products into the export sector, increasing competition for our exporters. Prawns is a good example of where we've been significantly um, affected with the price of prawns coming down significantly over the years because of increased competition from aquaculture prawns. Also here in our own supermarkets, we see evidence of this competition with imported aquaculture, fish and prawn products competing vigorously alongside our local produce. So maintaining nimble and competitive cost structures is critical if the industry is to thrive and grow. And there's actually plenty of upside for growth, particularly when it's considered that world production is growing faster than population, implying that seafood consumption at the per person level is rising. Sorry, it's frozen up on me. Yep. And it's risen continuously since the 1960s. Consumer preferences are changing. For example, in Asia, incomes have risen, urbanisation's increased, populations are ageing, resulting in higher demand generally for seafood. The OECD FAO estimates that growth in per person consumption is going to continue over the outlook period, with the highest increases in per person consumption coming from the Asia region. In Asia, we see that per person levels of consumption are higher than the world average. So in Asia, people love their seafood. China and Japan are well in excess of the world average and they're both important markets for Australia. The good news here is that seafood is highly traded and higher world consumption in an environment of constrained wild catch production <coughs> is placing upward pressure on prices. Seafood trade is now worth around 140 billion US dollars, making fish one of the most traded agri-food products on the planet. The Asian region accounts for a substantial portion of the trade and is a great market to sell into 
for a lot of our high-value, low-volume products. So how can Australia's seafood sector participate in the growing export market while at the same time meet our domestic needs? To answer this question, it's useful to look at the structure of Australian production. Australia produces a smorgasbord of seafood from niche products like octopus, and Arno will talk about this later, to a suite of finfish, crustacean and mollusk species. There are a few species, however, that dominate production. In the wild caught sector, it's rock lobster, prawns, abalone and tuna. In the aquaculture sector, it's salmonids, tuna, edible oysters and pearl oysters. Up until 11-12, there was a significant trend decline in wild caught earnings against a background of rising earnings from aquaculture production. More recently, higher prices for rock lobster and prawns have boosted the production value of the wild caught sector. In the next five years, we project steady growth in earnings from rock lobster, rock lobster and salmonids, but slightly lower earnings from other commodities such as abalone and tuna. This is a point I'll return to later in when we look at the outlook. The exchange rate goes some way to explain these trends, as this impacts directly on prices and as do supply and demand conditions. A high Australian dollar exchange rate for much of the past decade had a negative impact on beach prices for most of our exported species, with rock lobster being the exception. Here, limited supply growing, going into a growing Chinese market has put prices on an upward path. The negative impact of a high exchange rate on the wild catch sector was more than offset by the expansion of the salmon industry. More recently, higher prices for rock lobster and prawns have boosted the production of the wild caught sector. This figure gives us a closer look. Lower prices have essentially halved earnings from prawns in the last 10 years. In contrast, beach prices for rock lobster have been rising since 4.5 as a result of tighter supply and growing Asian demand. demand. The price of prawns of tuna have, incre uh, tuna have increased more recently. Let's look at the domestic market. Well, it's steadily growing with consumption estimated by ABS to be around 350,000 tonnes on an edible equivalent basis. Here imported products now make up around 70% of all seafood consumed in Australia. Imported seafood products are an important part of the consumption mix and in some cases assist industry to meet their throughput needs throughout the year. We should also note that the imported mix of products is quite different to the products we export. That is, we tend to export high, high value, low volume products, but tend to import a lot of low value, um, high value volume products. More and more, however, local premium seafood products are being placed into the domestic market. This is being driven by clever marketing campaigns and new ways of selling and presenting products. Arthur will be able to elaborate this further on this trend in his presentation. Despite this trend, Australia's rising population and the throughput needs of local processes, however, does mean that imports will remain an important component of Australia's seafood consumption mix. Australia became a net importer of fisheries products in value terms in 7-8, and since then the gap between imports and exports has widened. Some of the widening gap is attributed to lower value of exports. The, va the gap continued to increase in 13-14 despite the rise in, in exports that was boosted by lower exchange rate and high prices of rock lobster and prawns. This illustrates the pressure that increasing population in Australia is pressing on, putting on seafood demand. While Australia is a small producer by world stand standards, producing only 240,000 tonnes out of a global production of 158 million, we are comparatively more export oriented than most seafood export producing nations, exporting almost half of our production in value terms. We export mainly high value products like rock lobster, abalone, pearls, tuna and prawns, but rock lobster dominates mainly a reflection of the high unit values involved and the volumes exported. Over half our fish exports are now sent to the eastern China region, comprising China, Hong Kong, Vietnam and Chinese Taipei. In contrast, the share of exports going to Japan has declined over the past decade. This reflects mainly a rise of the eastern China region as a key demand centre for seafood and increased competition in Japan's market following the burgeoning of the global aquaculture sector. Now turning to the outlook, let's look at prices first. Looking ahead, we are projecting that prices of some of our key production commodities will rise in 15-16, largely the result of an assumed further depreciation of the Australian dollar. 
For the remainder of the outlook period, prices are projected to either decline slightly or remain steady in real terms. So most of the projected growth in after 15-16 is projected to come from volume rather than higher prices. And here, projected higher production volumes of salmonid aquaculture and wild-caught rock lobster will be, boost, be important to boost earnings. These two sectors underpin a projected growth in earnings of 1.7% in real terms to reach $2.7 billion by 1920. That's real terms. In nominal terms, it will be an industry worth it, around $3 billion by that time. The plans of a substantial increase in aquaculture production, and Dallas will elaborate on this later, have not yet been factored into this outlook. As this production comes online, aquaculture prawns will become a substantial part of future outlooks. At the outset of this presentation, I mentioned that we are fairly optimistic that the sector is now better positioned to cope with changes in market fundamentals. I've already mentioned the exchange rate, but there are a number of other reasons. First, energy prices are down, assisting industry to become more competitive with less fuel-intensive protein sources. Fishing is a fuel-intensive operation by its nature, and fuel makes a substantial portion of operating costs. The cost of fueling a vessel for a single fishing, fishing trip can easily run into the order of thousands of dollars. Abare's research of Commonwealth fisheries indicates that fuel costs range between 10 and 40 per cent of total cost of operating a vessel, with the share being highest for trawl fisheries. When considering that the annual operating cost of a vessel can, can be often in excess of $1 million, one can imagine what the fuel bill must be like. This is why the recent moderation in diesel fuel is welcome news to many in the industry. Lower fuel operating costs allows fishers to better compete with less fuel intensive food products and improve their bottom line. Secondly, labour cost pressures have eased, making workers exiting the mining industry available to the seafood sector. In the last decade, fishing businesses have seen many of their best skippers, engineers and crew exit the industry to take up positions in the booming mineral sector. Many skills that are useful to fishing businesses are also useful in the mineral sector, with offshore exploration activity being a good example where vessel skills would come in handy. Finally, recent bilateral trade agreements with China, Japan and Korea will over time improve access for exports to these markets. Tariff reductions for Australia's exports to these countries will put Australian exporters on a more level playing field with competing nations that already have trade agreements in place. Key products to benefit are rock lobster, abalone ex and exports to China and tuna exports to Japan and Korea. But the seafood sector more broadly will benefit from these trade agreements. So there is much to be optimistic about in this year's outlook. But the industry's future prospects importantly hinge on the industry being sustainable. ABES has substantial experience in assessing the state of fish stocks, having produced almost 20 years of Commonwealth fish stock reports. More recently, ABES has coordinated the publication of a report covering stocks across all Australian fishing jurisdictions. The reports were initiated by the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation and ABES and have been a collaborative effort involving all government fisheries research agencies and well over 100 researchers across the country. I'm happy to report here that Australian Fish Stocks Reports 2014 for our wild catch sectors provided a very positive pi picture about the health of our wild catch fisheries. The 2014 reports cover 238 stocks across 68 spe species, covering 85% of the catch taken in 12-13 and 90% of the value. The reports find that almost 90% of the catch reported in the reports was from sustainable stocks. So going forward, I think we are well positioned to supply both the domestic and export markets. So to summarise this presentation, global demand for seafood is rising. At the same time, Australian consumption of seafood is also increasing. Moreover, trade agreements recently made with China, Japan and Korea improve access to key export markets for seafood. Input price pressures of ease, so have it as have exchange rates, indicating a potential rise in competitiveness of the sector. The inherent sustainability of our wild catch fisheries and the robust management practices that, practices that keep them in that state will ensure that wild catch is available to consumers for the foreseeable future. The aquaculture sector is also in a phase of expansion and we'll hear a lot about that today. So in combination, these factors 
give us the confidence that the outlook for the fishery and aquaculture remains positive. Thank you.